All right, I'm Leo Panich, interviewing David Harvey on his new book for Jacobin. The book is called 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. Well, David, congratulations on your latest magnum opus. Thank you. It's uh, a great read, challenging read. Uh, it's beautifully written as usual. It has some phenomenal turns of phrase. I especially like the courage with which you said biopolitics, bracket, whatever that is. Uh, I wouldn't have had the courage to write that. I thought that was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> um, and and uh, I think you raise the bar of the challenge to the left with this sentence. If everyone who worked in an anti-poverty organization converted overnight to an anti-wealth politics, we would soon find ourselves living in a very different world. Yeah. I thought that was also beautifully put. And then there's one other great phrase that I'd like you to be, maybe begin by elaborating on, uh, where you define the political challenge to the left, I think. You say this will be a problem in the future, but it seems to me it defines our problem now. Uh, that we face a stark choice between impossible reform and improbable revolution. Yeah. And I wonder whether you want to... Uh, it seems to me to some extent the book comes out of trying to break through um, what seems to be the case, that you know, when we just look for what doesn't appear to us like very radical reform, right. uh, the impossibility of it comes forward in terms of, does that mean pulling out of the global market, which you say would be suicide. Yeah. Um, uh, so every reform we throw up seems impossible, insofar as it's going to matter as a reform. And yet revolution seems, as you say, improbable. Right. Uh, so how does this book relate to getting us past that? I think uh, what, it, what I hope it does is to say that uh, revolution is a process. It's a long process. And it takes, uh, you have to think about it in the long durée, as some people like to say. And when you think about it in those terms, you start to look for movement. And, and it's no accident, I think, that we call these political activities movements. Uh, and then the question is, which way are they moving and what are they moving towards? And if we have a clearer idea of what uh, the aims of the movement are, then you could, in fact, bridge this idea of a reform uh, to the point where it moves forward to the point of a revolutionary transformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the example I always use of that is Marx's chapter on the working day where he talks about a limitation on the working day as being a reform which workers look for. And clearly at a certain point capital is perfectly okay uh, with that. Uh, they can actually com uh, compensate, if you like, for transformations in the length of the working day within, a certain, within certain parameters. But when the working day becomes three hours long, then that doesn't leave the capitalist any room for manoeuvre at all. So we look at a process and kind of say we want to get to the point where uh, we want to have the maximum free time for everybody and the minimum amount of time being spent on those things which are considered necessary or those things from which capital can actually extract surplus value and a profit. The rest of the time can be spent on other things which are non-profit oriented, non... So, so that's what I mean uh, by uh, an impossible reform because capitalists are wily enough to know that if the working day becomes much less than eight hours or something like that then they're beginning to get into trouble and they're going to put a stop to it. Uh, so there's a political stop to it. Uh, but uh, then uh, an improbable revolution is when the working class will realize that actually once they've got an eight hour working day they've really got to have in mind they want to get it down to a three hour or a one hour working day. Yeah. Uh, this all, in a sense, becomes more relevant, and the book is obviously written with this in mind, in the context of the expectation that the crisis uh, that emerged in 2007-8 and that we're still in uh, ought to make things easier. Uh, and uh, one of the great things about the book, and uh, we've known each other for a long time and I know we share this, uh, and you do it very well in the book, uh, is one, uh, unlike many orthodox Marxist economists, you don't want to insist there's one explanation for every crisis. Right. Uh, 
Uh, and I know we share the view that the way in which old crises are resolved lay the seeds, and you say it in the book very well, for the mode in which the next crisis evolves. Yeah. Uh, and you do that very well. Um, uh, but I think, despite the title of the book, The End of Capitalism, uh, Seventh in Contradiction, The End of Capitalism, uh, the central message of the book uh, is that, in fact, crises don't bring about the end of capitalism. And you actually, uh, I think, say very powerfully, Marx never said capitalism would collapse under its own contradictions. So where does that leave you, given the title, given the arrow pointing downwards? Uh, uh, the theme of the book is, it seems to me, much more that, that crises don't cause the end of capitalism than someone buying this might think, aha, this is telling me how this crisis is bringing it to an end. Crises are always opportunities. Uh, and even, even the, the bourgeoisie says things like, never let a good crisis go to waste. So it means they can do all kinds of things they, they want to do in the course of a crisis that they couldn't do uh, at other times. And so in this crisis, for example, the right wing has used it as an opportunity to go after you know, the social welfare state and all those kinds of things. So and uh, in, introduce this notion of austerity. So for the, for the right wing, this crisis has provided a set of opportunities. Now, I feel it's also provided a set of opportunities for the left wing uh, to do the same. Uh, in other words, uh, not end up with austerity, but to kind of say we want a radical transformation uh, of this system. And, and uh, my point in the book is to say, and there's no mechanical way in which crises cause anything. Uh, what we do have is a, is a condition uh, which would allow people to change the world. In other words, I firmly accept Marx's view that we can make our own history, even though we don't make his, that history under our own, own, own uh, under circumstances of our own choosing. So, so to me, the important thing is what do people do? And if there's going to be an end to capitalism, it's because people want an end to this system. Then the question arises, why would they want an end when <laughs> capitalism has given you all of these uh, benefits uh, in terms of new technologies and, and, and the like, which I think we should clearly acknowledge as being one of the positive aspects of what capitalism has done. But when you look at where we're at in terms of the nature of jobs, meaningless jobs are now, if you like, the mode. Uh, our relation to nature it's actually becoming a disaster area and everybody, I think, apart from the very far right, knows it. So when you look at the situation, you say, well, if capitalism survives, it's going to be so awful to live with that I would rather live with something else. And what crises do is to highlight what it is that it might be awful to live with and, and therefore, at that point, allow people on the left to take an opportunity to say, look, this is what's happening. This is what's likely to happen again. Uh, we're not out of this, uh, uh, this is the new normal, if you like, and this new normal is very uncomfortable to live with, so this is a moment when people might rise up and change the world. And, and what you just said about uh, economic crises uh, producing conditions under which capitalism is terrible to live, but not necessarily ending it, has always been your position and is very well expressed in your Contradiction 16 in this volume uh, on capital's relationship to nature. Yeah. Uh, you know, you call that a dangerous contradiction, not a fatal one. Uh, and, and I wonder whether you want to expand on that, uh, precisely in terms of you know, nature doesn't set barriers to capitalism. Uh, it's political and economic conditions that doesn't allow us to resolve the way in which capitalism is creating dangerous contradictions in, in nature. I think it depends a lot on how you conceptualize things. And what I tried to do in that uh, uh, chapter was to talk about the way in which we should understand uh, capital in relationship to nature. That uh, if we regard them as external to each other, then we can imagine two billiard balls interacting and smashing each other and doing nasty things to each other. What I tried to say was that capital is its own ecosystem and has its own ecology. And that therefore what happens is the contradictions of capital are internalized within nature in certain ways. Uh, that we have transformed the environment uh, 
uh, to the point where it becomes a capitalist product. It's what Neil Smith used to talk about as in terms of the production of, 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 of nature, where it's been produced, but it's also, of course, then being consumed. So that uh, what we have to do then is to kind of recognize that there is a tension uh, between this production and consumption of the natural world, which is the ecosystem that capital has created. I mean, if you go to Argentina, what do you see? You see field after field of soybeans. This is what capital's, this is capital's ecosystem. And of course, to maintain it, we need, you know, the, the, the pesticides, we need the, 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 all the fertilizers, we need the high-tech instruments and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, so, so if there's a contradiction there, it's not because there's something out there called nature, which is somehow or other, you know, as the weather forecast say, this is Mother Nature doing nasty things, or, you know, she's behaving badly today or something. It's because that system itself is internally contradictory. That uh, actually that field with the soybeans in it is being utilized in such a way that the moisture content is declining. Uh, it's becoming highly, highly dependent upon uh, chemicals and, and the rest, and we're starting to create uh, a world which uh, is, has certain dangers. So, for example, uh, carcinogenics uh, within, both within the soybeans and within the, uh, within the atmospheres around the soybean fields because of that. So, so the things of that sort, uh, the unintended consequences of a production system. So what I wanted to do there was to kind of say, um, the general imagery, which is the apocalyptic imagery of, uh, you know, some end of the world, which comes when, I don't know, or everything freezes or everything becomes a wash in water or something like that. Those apocalyptic uh, endings are really seen as, I think, uh, for me, uh, not very relevant uh, to the dynamics of the present situation. Yeah, and uh, I think that's wonderful. This is a your first article in the Register back in 1992 first laid that out, drawing right, then yes, on Neil right, Smith as well. Right, yes, wonderful. Right. And, and uh, last year a terrific book was published by PM Press, uh, edited by Sasha Lilly, called Catastrophism, Yes, uh, which took all this on, I, I felt, in a very, very good way. Um, and yet, I, I wonder whether because you're writing this for political reasons, because you're trying to encourage people to develop the kind of politics that will take them from an anti-poverty group to an anti-wealth group. Uh, whether you don't overstep the bounds to what becomes a, a logical contradiction, which becomes a, a, a contradiction in the sense that Aristotle meant it, that is, in which you actually contradict yourself. And I felt there was an element of phraseology, at least, uh, perhaps for populist reasons, which did make it sound like capitalism, both because of economic crises and because of ecological crises, uh, was, as you put it at one point, uh, a, the last gasp of capitalism. You use that in the context and you cite Gortz, of uh, the move towards immaterial right. labor, so a much longer right. process. But you do sometimes use phrases like this. Mm -hmm. Um, you, in, in relation to nature, you say uh, there's a key inflection point ca caused by what you described right. in the previous right. chapter on, on compounded capitalist economic growth. Right. There's a key inflection point uh, which has an exponential impact. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder whether there isn't, dare I say, and you say you don't want to do this, but I, yeah. I get a sense that there is this in the book towards the end, or maybe even right through it, a certain Malthusian quality ah, to the Malthus, argument. Malthus, you want to get into Malthus. Well, there is, there is a tone, <laughs> right? especially when it comes to compounded growth, as partly an explanation for crisis and as partly an explanation for the ecological crisis, that does take you very close to catastrophism. Mm -hmm. What do you think no, that? no, not, ne not necessarily, you see. The, the, the big issue for me is that, uh, historically, uh, capital, when it's uh, found itself that its own ecosystem has internalized certain fundamental constraints, adapts and has adapted very fast uh, in, in the past. 
Uh, many people were predicting environmental catastrophe after World War II into the 1940s, 1950s. Then along came the Green Revolution, you know, which is a very capitalistic system. In other words, it's a new form of agrarian capitalism which, which actually circumvents many of the problems which were, which were posed at that time. And this is what Malthus got wrong, which was to say there were no such possibilities. I'm arguing those possibilities are there all of the time. And that we're, the point we've got to right now, where uh, most of Latin America has become one big vast soybean plantation uh, for the Chinese market, that that actually is now uh, not, not at, actually at, at an absolute limit, but is relatively speaking becoming close to a limit. So then the big question is, well, what, in what ways uh, can agricultural productivity be shifted once again, much as the Green Revolution did it in new New ways, and of course, what we've seen doing is is, is uh, biological engineering, genetic engineering, and all the rest of it, which is now coming in to the point where we may actually end up with uh, sort of growing uh, grains without water, or you know, crazy things like that. So, so this means a, re a complete redefinition of capital's ecosystem, and and I think that th those redefinitions. Uh, of course, mean transformation of social relations and, of course, transformation of the kind of nature that gets produced. Now, when I kind of say there's a limit to this, uh, I tend to kind of argue this is, this is an aesthetic limit more than anything else, that actually the, the way in which we're relating to nature is so alien, and this is why I take it back uh, towards the end of that chapter into alienated relation to nature, that it's human alienation which is at the, the, there now. How much alienation can human beings take? I think there turns out to be almost no limit to the amount of alienation they can take, but they revolt at certain points. And so the big, that's the big question mark for me. It's in that, that human dialectic of relation to nature where, where it seems to me uh, the real political leverage goes, not by claiming that the whole of humanity is going to die tomorrow uh, if we don't do this, or the world is going to come to an end if we don't do that. This is so, very so, important. Yeah. This, is, this, this to me was a very important part of what I had yeah. to say. Yeah, and I think it's always been your message. It comes to clear here that we can end up living in a world that looks like Blade Runner. Yes. And we will see revolts yes. in that world. Right. And that's great. Nevertheless, I still think that as one reads, as I read those chapters, uh, that you're trying to come up with reasons as to why there not only is a barrier in nature, but there's a barrier to capital accumulation. So you yes. go through a discussion in the compound growth chapter. After you say, I'm not a Malthusian, and, and you give good reasons for not being. Right. You then come back to, well, there's been this enormous growth in social labor, which allowed them to get out of previous crises. Right. Time magazine, after all, in 1975, had a full-page front cover, Can Capitalism Survive? Yes. At the type of time of the energy right. crisis. Right, right. right. The type of the inflation crisis. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, the uh, the FT did after this crisis the same yeah. thing right right is capitalism over yeah uh, and yet you start looking for reasons why it might be you say we can't have the same entry of women into the labor force right the enormous proletarianization of the global south is reaching its limits yes uh, there are you know demographic limits to being able to continue yeah. to do this and you offer others. So you know, I wonder again whether you're not pressing towards capital itself is running up against the limits of its ability uh, to accumulate in new ways. And you even go so far as to say that uh, in terms of accumulation by dispossession, there are fewer and fewer things for them to, to dispossess. To dispossess, yes. So you do seem to be pushing towards not, I think not so much nature is putting a stop to this as an external barrier, which is a wrong way of thinking, right, obviously. Right. Uh, although I wish it was obvious to most Marxist ecologists. Yeah. Uh, but that capital itself is running up against limits that is not allowing it to accumulate. See, the question you're asking me, Leo, really is about the validity of using a term like limits. Uh, and the way I would uh, answer that is in the following kinds of terms. Okay, we're sitting in a room here. There's only a certain amount of oxygen in this room. So those are limits on how much you and I and everybody else here can breathe in that oxygen. And, and so there are limits. Okay. But there's, then we can open the door. Then we can go outside. Okay. So we move. 
And when we move, a limit then gets dispersed. And I think that capital has approached many of these questions in that kind of fashion, that it works on uh, a particular model of, uh, of, say, constructing ecosystems, and it works it to its limit. And then at that point, what it does is when it encounters that limit, it starts to shift and goes and creates an alternative universe, as it were. Now, historically, it's done this through imperialism and it's done it through colonialism and it's done it in all these sorts of ways. Um, but we're now living on this planet Earth where the question is, you know, well, okay, where are the spaces in which you can go? And there are not many left. I mean, okay, there's Africa and there's, 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 there's some places. So now you've got to look at uh, the limit cannot be, uh, uh, be really circumvented by, by spatial extension. It's going to have to be limited by, a, by a, it's going to be actually a, a converted by uh, intensification. Uh, intensification or the transformation of what value is and what value is about. Now, you yourself have made the argument, and I don't agree with you, but I'm going to take one of your arguments for the moment and say, all right, let's suppose finance can create value. And if finance <laughs> creates value, then we don't actually need agriculture and we don't, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around, okay. We can, we can get rid of those limits because capital now has a no, new terrain in which it can create as much value as it wants. And, the, and where are the limits to the creation of value within finance? For me, uh, this means that, for example, capital can survive by creating fictitious capital. And that fictitious capital then circulates and, and breeds more fictitious capital. Meanwhile, the top 1% w withdraws enormous amounts of money and wealth and power from that fictitious activity. So this is what, what, what is significant to me, is that capital changes the terrain. It moves from one room to another room, or one set of rooms to another. It moves from a house to a mansion. It moves from the mansion to the city. It moves in this kind of way. So when I'm talking about limits, it's nearly always relative to the particular situation. And right now I see a particular situation in which, and this is why the language of immaterial labor and so on has some significance, but I think it's set out in a very, very wrong way. But nevertheless, when, if capital can start actually cre you know, looking for new sources of value creation, which are not those traditional sources of people making things or growing things or mining things and all the rest of it, but can look for alternative sources of value creation, then it can get out of its dilemmas of how, uh, of how to continue to expand. Because the one thing that can expand infinitely without any constraints is the money supply, for example. I mean, it, you could just add zeros to it. And well, it, 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 it's not a matter of either or, though. So, you know, if as... No, it's not uh, either if, or, if, but... If, as Neil says, uh, they can accumulate in our own genes. Yes. Can turn commodities out of our right, genes. Right, exactly. And, you know, you, here's you see the private and the private coming together. What could be more private than our genes? Yes. And yet they privatize our genes, yes. our DNA, yes, right. in a way that becomes a commodity. Right. And this, you could say, is the ultimate alienation. Yes. And, and should be the right. basis for struggle. Right. But so it isn't a matter of uh, financialization as against. No, no. Uh, the no, extraction. No. There are many. Productivity. There are many things going on here that in, combine in the, way, the two. In the way, and, and that's what's so interesting about the contemporary era. The different ways in which capitalists are, seek, are seeking to create value out of all sorts of things by things like getting into our now, DNA. Now, let me press you on the difference between us, because I think uh, ultimately, when you come to the limit in this book, and I've only seen it in this book, I was surprised by the amount of emphasis you put on the importance of the connection between a commodity money, gold, silver, clamshells, although you don't use that example, right. uh, and uh, the uh, limit that productive capital is running up against. Yeah. And you go so far as to say at one point uh, that limitless money creation, since uh, uh, tying money creation to commodities like gold and silver broke down in the early 70s, is ultimately, I think you say it towards the end of that contradiction right. 15, is the basis of uh, the growing dangerous con contradiction yes, right. that shows itself in, in right. uh, 
financial crises and much deeper crises. And this is where it seems to me, uh, one, the gold standard was not something that was very good for most working people. Right. It pro produced an automaticity in terms of austerity right, that we right. couldn't even, you know, attack them in terms of a neoliberal ideology. Yeah, right. It was just a mechanism. Yeah. Right. Um, so the gold standard was hardly a good thing in terms of what it yes. did to people. Yeah. But more than that, even when it was operating, and it was hardly operating between 45 and 70 anyway. Right. Um, it, it, the, the degree of the link between the creation of money supply, uh, paper money, and you know, the actual material amount of gold, lead amount, all of the difficulties of figuring out right. what social labor goes into gold or silver or clams or whatever. Right, right. This, seems to me, this seemed to me the weak part of the book. And, and sure, you'd not be surprised given right. Uh, right. The, the position I take on how productive, or at least indirectly productive, financialization has been yeah. for an integrated global capitalism right. in our era. Right. Um, yeah, but look what, look, look what in effect has happened. Uh, after 1970, when you cut the metallic base to the money, the global money supply, and I agree with you, it was a, it was a pretty fictional thing from 1945 onwards, I mean, I agree with you all of that. Uh, but when you finally cut it, what did you get? Towards the end of the 1970s, you got this huge kind of inflation where even, you know, the United States and Britain were in inflation. Uh, at that point, it seems to me the, the, the function of the gold standard was displaced by an orthodoxy in terms of what the central bank policy should be, which should be anti-inflationary. And it should be always anti-inflationary. So the German Bundesbank, which has always been about that, and, and the Federal Reserve, by the time you get into the 1980s, are both of them in this anti-inflationary stance, which is then incorporated into the constitutional foundation of the European Central Bank as an anti-inflationary institution. It's not even concerned with employment. So you're kind of saying the gold standard was never very good for the working class, but I'm saying the central bank policy has not been very good for the working class either, because both of them have to take care of the question of, of, of inflation. The result of that is, and this wonderful thing, the minutes of the Federal Reserve, which you know got released that summer when the whole place was crashing. And in the discussions of the Federal Reserve, uh, inflation was mentioned, I don't know what, was 300 times, unemployment was mentioned 16 times, and crisis was mentioned eight or something like that. In other words, all policymakers are fixated uh, on, on anti-inflation, which is supposed to do uh, the same job through the central bank as the gold standard used to do of, uh, uh, of locking in uh, the money supply in a certain kind of way. And, of course, you get people like Krugman kind of saying, that's crazy. We should actually no. loosen it. So, but but no. my, point, my point is that, that actually this limit, uh, which had been set by the gold, by the, the money commodity, gets displaced by a limit which is now internalized no. within the orthodoxy of the central banks. I, I think that this piece of your book betrays your fundamental perspective, frankly. Uh, because uh, you want to argue through the book uh, that it's human choices and yes. social and political yes. arrangements. Right. And it was, in fact, the class struggle uh, yeah. uh, around wages and the social wage and the unionization of women, etc., uh, that was push, pushing a wage push yes. inflation, no, or it was third world commodity prices yeah. that was pushing the inflation. Okay. Okay. It wasn't breaking with the gold standard, and in fact, the Federal no. Reserve was accommodating the inflationary pressures by already increasing the money supply. That's what the Friedmanites were screaming about. Yeah. But from through the sixties, in fact, yes, before right. it broke. Right. Yes. 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 So I don't think it is a matter of moving from one mechanism to another. Uh, moreover, uh, thank heaven they don't have the gold standard, because had it not been for Barnicky and the Federal Reserve's uh, uh, quantitative easing, right. the conditions we'd be living under would indeed be far, far worse. And the Federal Reserve is very fed up with the Bundesbank, whose orthodoxy around the gold yes, standard right, approach, right, right. They have, they're tearing their hair out, out over. Yeah. You know, they're afraid Greece will introduce capital control, right. which is the thing that the American Treasury fears most on the money. Yeah, no, I think, uh, no, and obviously we're going to disagree on that because I, I, don't, I don't agree that, uh, for instance, uh, value is actually created by finance capital. 
uh, and I, I find it very difficult uh, and I don't think uh, you take uh, enough cognizance of the importance of fictitious capital. Uh, I think you tend to treat all of the capital in there as if it's real capital when actually I think this category of fictitious capital is, uh, is terribly, terribly important. So we can disagree about, uh, ab about that, but I think it is significant that uh, this anti-inflation mantra, uh, which dominates uh, discussions, uh, is something which uh, has to be uh, challenged. And it is of no, it is of absolutely no uh, help to the, any working class movement. But my point about this is that this needs a much more fundamental reform than just simply shifting back to, I don't know, a more, a more, a more Keynesian or slightly more sort of flexible. I mean, by your standards, capital can continue infinitely into the future because they can create value through financial operations. And I'm kind of going, no, I don't think that is... Well, not only. Right. No, not only. No, but never not only. No, no. But, it's how but, much does it facilitate yes, social facilitate. labor. Yes, right. And, so, and, uh, and, and that. Uh, well, I, the example I would give is that you treat the money awash in the 70s uh, just floating around because it was liberated right. from gold as why all this money got pumped down to Latin America, laid the basis for the debt crisis, etc. I would say that uh, that was primarily petrodollars. Yes. Well, well, so I it say, was coming no, I out say. of productive. It wasn't coming out of the break with gold. No, no, no. I never right. said that. Well, well, I, think no, it, I think you used that example right after the... Well, in any case. Yeah, right. right. No, because I've said... But it I, I think that Petro, laid the basis for dollars. the discipline that was imposed upon yes. the global south. Right. right. Not that it directly right. necessarily was productive, but it laid the basis for the discipline in the global yeah. south yeah. that allowed for the proletarianization and the development of manufacturing in the yeah. global south. Yeah in a way that integrated the Global South into a dependent, but nevertheless right. very right. integrated, right. and in some ways dynamic part for a long yeah. period, right. of, of a global capitalism. Well, so I, I think in that sense finance was functional. Yes. Disciplinary, yeah. right? right? But also, of course, providing access to resources for a period. Yeah. Um, I guess the way I would approach that, or do approach that in my writings is to actually treat uh, the disciplinary apparatus is a form of accumulation by dispossession, primitive mm. accumulation, mm. which actually, and you know, you're dead right that, you know, it's going into the, the developing world of, uh, and, and, and putting austerity on it and doing all those kinds of things, liberated vast labor resources right. in those areas. So I agree with you entirely on, on, on that. Okay, just uh, two or three other things. You have this metaphor, which sounded wonderful when I first read it on page nine, right at the beginning of the book. Uh, where you say, look, I'm making this distinction between capital and capitalism. Yes. And I'm thinking of capital as the engine of a cruise ship. Yeah. There, you know, on the upper decks, there's this hierarchy of the rich people going across the ocean and uh, the people on the lower decks and then the stewards and the engineers and so <coughs> on. And then there is this machine down there. And if it stops working, uh, then the whole thing right. comes to a stop. Right. And I had trouble with the distinction for two reasons that you're trying to make between capital and capitalism, because, of course, as you immediately go on to show, uh, the engine is an engine made up of social relations between people. Yes. It's not apart from the relationship between the engineers right. and the captain. The engine actually is in the relationship between the engineers and the captain. Yes. Right? And, and for that yes. matter, yes. even the, the, the passengers. Right. Right. Uh, so I found that a problematic metaphor right. that also then spilled over to the distinction you want to make between capital and capitalism. Right. You mainly refer to capitalism in relation to, well, I'm not really dealing with gender and race. Although later on, often in very suggestive and, and insightful passages, you say, look, you can't understand the working class in America if you don't understand race. Right. Right? right. You've got to understand its relationship to capital if you don't understand right. it. You say that right. very explicitly. Right. So I found the distinction, both in terms of how you're trying to get the feminists and the black power people off your backs. That's capitalism. I'm not dealing with that. Right. Uh, and in terms of, you know, what's capital, therefore, since I think the way in which class is structured is structured and gendered, and that you do as well. In terms right. of. Not sure the distinction you try to make in the book, yeah. uh, which you don't con maintain consistently anyway, right. I think. Well, really it's a fuzzy—it's a fuzzy boundary between the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah right.
Yeah, you can't understand uh, the ship without its engine, and the engine doesn't work unless there are engineers social relations, and social relations yeah. embedded in it. Yes, of yeah. course, yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's right. But what I was really trying to do was, uh, in uh, you know, this uh, the whole list of contradictions really comes out of a reading of Marx, and so I'm picking up on all of the ones I could find in Marx, and I found actually a lot more than seventeen, but I reduced them to to seventeen. Um, and, and, and it, but it did seem to me it was worthwhile asking the question, what is it that makes this engine work? You know, what is it that, that the internal relations within that, that engine? Uh, and and uh, to me, uh, that is rather badly understood. And it's sometimes badly understood precisely because some other aspects of capitalism get really caught up. Uh, and and uh, sort of muddled in with it. For instance, the whole question of nationalism and national identity and geopolitics and so on, which I'm a, a field I'm extremely interested in and 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 the like. But on the other hand, that 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 doesn't really get me to what I think are some of the core issues uh, of you know what what what's the problem be, be, between say use value and exchange value. And, and why is that so significant? And why don't we talk about it more? Why do we not see that this, what happened in, cra in that crash in the housing market had a lot to do with this relationship between use value and exchange value? Why don't we see also exchange value is connected to the money and how money measures it and how money is subject to speculative activity? Why don't we understand and it allows private persons to actually accumulate social wealth in the way it does? Why don't we understand those kinds of links between the different contradictions? So to what to me seemed to be very insightful was to actually circumscribe uh, the nature of the contradictions in such a way that people could get a very clear understanding first off of how significant and important they are to daily life and secondly, how they interrelate, interrelate with each other to actually make a very sort of complex uh, engineering structure at the, at, the, at the heart of what cap capitalism is about in terms of that economic engine. So that's what I was, 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 was trying to do. Yeah. And I think it's that kind of knowledge that seems to me to be crucial to impart. And I therefore had to leave certain things aside, <laughs> as, any, as any modeler would do. You kind of go, well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not dealing with this and that. I'm keeping these things at one side, which is not to say I think they're unimportant. It's just that I'm keeping them to one side so I can get a very clear understanding of a certain structure of, 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 of contradictions. And I think actually what impressed me, I mean, you, you get... Uh, depressed sometimes by what you write and you sometimes get impressed by what you write. I was actually impressed as I went, was writing this about how these uh, contradictions related to each other and, and the way in which they, they connected with each other and that you couldn't imagine uh, overthrowing, if you like, this crucial relationship between private property and the state uh, without actually dealing with the exchange value, use value kind of uh, contradiction and without the monetary stuff and, and all the rest of it. Okay, the, the book ends, the 17th contradiction, which we've already been talking about, is uh, the way in which capitalism, by its very nature and its dynamics, uh, alienates people from their own species being, in all kinds of ways. And you, uh, that's, that's very, very good. Uh, you don't offer a recipe for what's to be done about that. Okay. Uh, as close as you get to it, I think. I mean, you do have some, you know, here's some programmatic ideas at the end and so on. Uh, is it would be a very good thing if anti-poverty organizations turned themselves into anti-capitalist organizations. Um, uh, but what you do have is a very profound, I think, negative, critical attitude to what much of the left has been doing the last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, you say, in passing, you know, not so much you write a chapter on this, but at various points from the beginning of the book on, your critical uh, localism, even of food sovereignty, local food sovereignty. You have a phrase at one point, very telling one, that as I said before, that it, it would be suicide to pull out of the world market. And yet we know some form of capital controls are needed. You're very critical of anarchism, and, and it's been the zeitgeist of our time in terms of horizontalism, anti-party orientation, and so on. Uh, I agree with all of this, of course, as you know. Yeah. Um, so what does that mean then uh, for uh, 
taking what you see as a growing condition of human alienation and producing the type of politics that has produced opposition, heaven knows, long before the current crisis, uh, but has not managed to offer a serious challenge to capitalism. Yeah. But what conclusions do we draw from this negative attitude and zeitgeist of our time? Um, yeah, you're emphasizing things a little bit more than I would actually myself uh, uh, admit, admit to or, or, or agree with. I, I have a complicated relationship with a lot of the social movements that have emerged uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years. I think they do incorporate a new way of doing politics. Uh, I think uh, this new way of doing politics is constructive and, and helpful. I actually think that nearly all struggles at some point or rather have to be local struggles and then they, they you know... So, so it's not quite the case that I'm a, a totally antagonistic to, to local action or that I think some aspects of what the food sovereignty movement looks for is, is, is good. Um, what, I, what I object to, I think, is what seems to me a self-limiting way in which many of these proposals are articulated to the point where people don't want to go beyond. They don't want to go beyond where, where they're at. And this applies to sort of horizontal assembly type systems. I think they're very good in certain situations. I think they don't work in others. Uh, I think that uh, what we need is a much more flexible approach uh, to organization. I don't uh, believe that the only approach is a political party. Uh, I think that a lot can be done without a political party and a lot can be done uh, outside of the framework of the state, but I think a lot can also be done by co-opting or transforming some aspects of state power in certain kinds of ways. Um, there's often a, a language problem here. Uh, I often say, well, you can't do without the state, but and people kind of go at me like, you know, for all, the, all the wrong things. Uh, but then they turn around and they say, well, I say, well, look, this premier example you like to use of the Zapatistas, they have a very, very uh, slick uh, military organization, which acts like a military organization, and Clausewitz would have been proud of them. Uh, and uh, they also have forms of government and so on, and they kind of say, oh, it's okay to talk about forms of government. You know, but it's not okay to talk about the state. So there's sometimes a, a, a kind of a, a slippage here about you know, what we mean. When I talk about you know, a form of government, I'm saying, well, we can be highly critical of the capitalist state, but it seems to be perfectly possible that we could construct the equivalent of, of some sort of organizational form which looks like a state, feels like a state, walks like a state, acts like a state, and we should be prepared to call it a state instead of calling it you know, some other kind of government. This is exactly kind of, what Marx said to Bakunin yeah, right, in right, his debate in the right, ADA. Right, yes, right. So Call I, it a state I, if you want. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Call it whatever you want. So, I, I, so I, that argument is sort of going on, and it's partly a linguistic argument as to what it is you are allowed to say and what it is you're not allowed to say in certain uh, debates. Uh, I had the same argument with a term like hierarchy. Hierarchy is bad, it's evil. Uh, some people now say, well, it's a necessary evil, but we still and I have to say, well, what is evil about, inherently about uh, a hierarchy? Uh, there's a hierarchy in the food chain, and we have a certain position in the food chain. Are you going to say we're evil because we're a certain you know, position in the hierarchy of a food chain? This is the kind of debate we, 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 we do get into, and a lot of it, it seems to me, is about you know, what, what's the appropriate language to describe that which we have in, have in mind. And, and uh, so I'm, I, but I'm very sympathetic to, to, to a lot uh, of the social movements that are occurring, which are outside of traditional working class social movements, but which are about anti-gentrification or which are about qualities of urban life. And I think that if you look at uh, the recent eruption in Brazil, uh, or the recent uh, eruption. Uh, this is the first. Uh, this, this is the first anniversary of uh, Gezi Park, and uh, right today, and uh, when we're when we're talking, and you look at those movements, and you say, well, these are these are movements about the qualities of urban life, and the quality of urban life is something we have to be revolutionary about. 
and that therefore We're not localist, about. not necessarily localist about. And in fact, we are faced right now, and many people haven't recognised it. I think we're faced right now with what I think is a crisis of, of planetary urbanisation. Uh, uh, there was a fantastic uh, statistic came in the Financial Times the other day that China, uh, between 2010 and 2012, produced the same amount of cement that has been produced in the United States throughout, throughout the whole of the last century. My God. Okay. Now, this is what I mean by when we start talking about limits and so on, you say you're pouring concrete everywhere. How much more concrete are you going to pour? And, and if we're, we're in this kind of expansion of, of urbanization, which is clearly where we're in, and the qualities of urban life are suffering as a consequence of this, and we see all kinds of inequalities embedded, yeah, then, then protests and revolutionary transformations of, of daily urban life become crucial. Uh, so to me, all of those organizations which are uh, you know, fighting for a better quality of urban life, uh, be it in questions of uh, education, public space. I mean, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to have political meetings in, in New York City right now is that there are no spaces that you can get which don't require very high rent. And so, so low-income populations have no place to go to hold political meetings because, you know, unless you can get a church to donate its spaces or others to donate its spaces, things become almost Im impossible to organize. Or you need to occupy. Or you need to occupy. And this is, my, this is again, the point. That right now, it's difficult to occupy because police repression comes in because space is so valuable. At times in the 1970s when, you know, space was not so valuable, then occupying could, could go on a pace and, and everybody was kind of, okay, it's better that somebody lives there than nobody lives there. So, so to me, uh, I think that uh, there's a whole uh, new way of doing politics which needs to be embedded in the new circumstances. And I think that part of those new circumstances are reflected in many of these movements which I'm critical of, but I'm critical of them because they don't see themselves as, as something uh, with a broader agenda and with, uh, with, if you like, a, a real revolutionary perspective in relationship uh, to the transformation of capitalism. Uh, there's often embedded in these social movements uh, a transformation of self, a transformation of local circumstances and of locality, and then that's the end of the story. But that should not be the end of the story. You have to go much, much further than that, as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to really launch a revolutionary project. Thanks, David. Well, Leo, this is one of the usual debates in which we agree on half of the things and disagree oh, no. on the other. We agree on at least yeah. 99%. Nine, okay. <laughs>